Hi guys, Charles here with Charles Harrison Music. We're going to talk about that lick I've just played today and what we're going to get to in this video is I don't really want you to go away and learn that particular lick, although if you want to by all means please do. We're going to break it down, we're going to understand the harmony going on, we're going to understand the phrasing, the articulation, the dynamics and the rhythm behind that lick so that you can go away and construct it yourself or construct your own lick. So this lick I've built was constructed using the random triadic approach, the chromatic approach by George Garzoni. George Garzoni is a very highly regarded tenor saxophone player born in Boston in 1950 and he's still very much an active player and teacher today. I've talked about his improvisation concept in a bit more detail than I will today up here. And just to give you the general idea, the way that we construct these lines is that we use a triad major, minor, augmented, diminished. The final note of our triad, we either move up or down a semitone. We then build a different triad. That's the general idea. I'll give you some more specific rules as we get to them when I'm breaking down the lick. What I want to conclude in today's lesson is that the specific notes we play are far less important than the phrasing we use to play them and the rhythmic work that we use. It's also really important that we don't worry too much about playing things at extreme tempos. Very often playing controlled at a more moderate tempo sounds more impressive and almost sounds faster in a way than playing something scrappy at a higher tempo. So please do bear that in mind. You'll notice I'm not really playing this lick very fast at all, but it sounds very intricate and uh, interesting. So in today's lesson, we're going to talk about the harmony of that lick, the tension, the resolution, what a TS to Piccadilly is. I'm going to talk you through my counting approach to this particular lick, and I'm going to explain how I chose how to phrase this particular lick. I'm also going to have a call to action for you guys to, to help me out with my phrasing and send me some resources because it's a, an area that I'm really interested in at the minute. Let's dive in with the harmony. This is really just a 5-1 lick in D minor. You'll notice there's a B flat in the key signature. That means we're in the key of F major and the relative minor is D minor. So the harmony itself is A altered for essentially all of the line and then right at the very end, a D major seven. Now I did just tell you this was in D minor and the lick is, but when we play a major chord at the end of a minor passage built on the root, we call that a tier to Picardy. Bach used this all the time, he'd play 25 minutes of minor and then right at the end we'd get this very sweet sounding major chord. And I really like the, this particular voicing of the major chord so I thought I'd chuck this in at the end. It's a really sweet sound. The chord A altered has, has a lot of tension to it. So this entire lick is building tension, building tension, building tension, and then not only do we get the release of the one chord, it's emphasized by the T.S. de Picardy, the fact that it's a major one chord. So at this point, I should say that the point of the chromatic approach is to try and relieve the worry about harmony on the improviser. Rather than worrying about specifically what chords are being played in a certain passage, think more about tension and release. So in this particular lick, A altered is the tension and the D major seven at the end is the release. And it's really important that our phrase, whatever happens between tension and release, the release has to have a beautiful resolution. So you'll notice I'm resolving onto an F sharp at the end and then building my chord above it. So you do need to land on the correct note at the resolution point. What happens in the tension point is random, chromatic, completely up to you. That is chaos. And when we get to the major chord at the end, we've got calm and order. 
Now the notes in this lick are nothing special, I will get to how I chose the notes in a moment, but I started off with just a triplet lick and it was really not doing it for me and I decided to start to muck around a little bit with note lengths. Now as you can see we've got triplets, semiquavers, quintuplets uh, and sextuplets, so we go through most subdivisions here. A weakness in my own playing that I've been aware of recently and have been working on is really feeling the note subdivisions. So when we hear ourselves play, we're in no doubt those were quavers, those were triplets, those were semi-quavers and those were quintuplets, whatever it is. And something I always make my students do is say it before you play it. I won't go into too much detail in the counting method today, but I will explain the count that I'm using for this particular lick. So my counting method, I always say the numbers as they go by because they're the most important things. And essentially the things I'm saying between the numbers are just subdivisions that I've chosen that work for me. So for a triplet, I say one perlet, two perlet, three perlet, four perlet, which is triplet, 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 triplet. That's a very common way of doing it. For semiquavers, I say one e under, two e under, three e under, four e under. For quintuplets, for fives, I say the word hippopotamus and replace the hip with uh, the number. So one apotamus, two apotamus, three apotamus, four apotamus. For the sextuplet, I kind of combine the semiquavers and the triplets. So I say one e per and letter, two e per and letter, three e per and letter, four e per and letter. Probably an easier way of doing it, but that's just the way I've always done it. So the count for this lick would be three, four. One perlet, two e and a three apotamus, four perlet, one e and a two e and a three e per and letter four and one perlet, two e and a three apotamus, four perlet, one e and a two e and a three e per and letter four and. Okay? I'll say that one more time slowly, but it's really important that I can say that with quite a lot of confidence. The hardest thing about that is actually moving my tongue. I'm not really confused in my head. Uh, I just trip over my tongue at the best of times. But as, of course, when you're playing, you can say it out loud or you can say it in your head. If you're a wind player, then you have to play it in your head. Say it in your head. So slowly, that would sound like this. Three, four. One per le, two e and a three a potter must four per le, one e and a two e and a three e per and let a four and. Okay, something to that effect. All you need to do, guys, is make sure you're keeping track of the beats and then choose a word that has the right number of syllables and just say that. Now, I replace the first syllable of the word with a number but you may want to say the number and then add on a four syllable word to create five beats. That's a way that some people like to do it. I've just always replaced the first syllable of a five beat word. So I say one apotamus, um, but you could use hippopotamus as for six. You could say one hippopotamus, two hippopotamus, and that would give you six beats. So what you say is irrelevant. The important thing is you are trying as accurately as possible to subdivide the beat and that you understand what the count is. So please do practice those specific counts. And if you learn nothing from today's lick, if you don't go away and actually learn it, at least try and count it because counting should be something we can all do. We all like to make fun of drummers. Um, all they need to do is hit a drum. But when we play something is so much more important than we often give it credit for. Next, let's talk about phrasing. Phrasing's my current area of interest. Again, I'm trying to really work on the, the basic elements in my own playing and worry less about technical achievements and tempo and more about musical and creative achievements. With that said, if anyone knows any really good resources around the, the lines of uh, musical feel or phrasing or articulation, anything like that, whether it's a YouTube video or a course, if you could let me know in the comments below. Um, I'm kind of struggling to find that sort of thing. I have looked into the Kenny Werner Effortless Mastery. I've, I've been uh, familiar with Kenny's work for quite a few years now. Um, something along those lines, but maybe a little bit more um, 
structured a little bit less zen not that i have any any problem with that i, I like the zen stuff but i quite like more a more methodical approach if anyone is aware of that um i'd really appreciate that something to do with feel and phrasing so i'll talk about how i've chosen to phrase this particular lick based on my understanding of phrasing as it stands today and like i say i hope my my idea of phrasing develops over the next few years so the first thing i've done is i've chosen a dynamic range you can choose whichever dynamic range you, you like, and of course, depending on where you use this lick, it would depend on how the band are playing. I've chosen pianissimo, which is triple P, going up to a mezzo forte dynamic. That gives you a very wide dynamic range, and it's really gonna draw the listener's ear in. They're gonna tell that something's happening here. So how do you decide where to accent and where to lean towards? Well, I use a few approaches. One is I'm really interested in the drum beat that would be going on in a 4-4 piece of music. Obviously, this example is in 4-4. Two and four are the strong beats. One is a moderately strong beat. Two and four are the strongest beats. Now, because I wanted to crescendo through this first bar, that means I'm going to be crescendoing towards beat four. Now, on top of that, you'll notice that the rhythm that we've already talked about, we start with triplet, ba, 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 then it's semi quavers ba 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 into quintuplet ba 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 that feels there like a really um like we're ramping up towards something like a an engine turning over whatever it is feels like that's the right point to lean towards so i've got and that there is my strong note So I'm leaning towards that note. Again, I want to say it. I want to feel this. I very often use a sort of inverted mountain shape when I'm thinking of phrasing. I hope this is, I hope my hands are the right way on the camera here. Going a gradual climb followed by a relatively steep fall, like three quarters, let's say three beats rise to one beat four. So we're going ba 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 and rising off at rising up and falling off at the end. Now in the second bar, I knew that I wanted a bit of a row feel to the end of this phrase and that final chord was going to be nice and quiet. So taking that same approach with a steady rise and a sharp fall I knew that by the time I got to that last chord, I wanted to have already done the fall. So it made sense for me for those sextuplets to be the fall themselves. Da 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 da. So the start of those sextuplets is the right place for the end of the rise. So I've got ba 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 ba. I hope that makes some sense. Finally, let's look at how I actually built this particular lick. I'm going to highlight the rules as I go through rather than sitting here blabbering on at you. We'll just play and explain it as I go. So it's all about triads, this approach, and I start with a nice root position A major triad. Once you've played your triad, you have the option of sliding up or down a semitone. That's Garzoni's rule. So I chose to slide up a semitone. You are then to play a different inversion to the one you've just played. Well, I just played the root position, but again, I've just played a root position. However, I've not broken the rule because his caveat is you can play the same inversion again. So I've played this F minor arpeggio, but if you play the notes in a different order. So I went root third fifth, I've slid up to F. I'm going to play an F minor arpeggio, but I'm going to go root fifth third. So I've got A triad, F minor triad in a different order, but they're both root position. And I slide up. I'm now going to do a, a second inversion chord, but I'm going to stretch it because I like to pretend I'm Alan Holdsworth. And I go A, D, F sharp. So it's a D major triad in its second inversion. So we've got A root position, F minor root position, different order, 
second inversion. I go up the semitone again. And I play a G augmented. Now there's no inversion to an augmented chord because it's symmetrical, so you can just play an augmented wherever you want. Uh, that's sometimes called a whole tone chord. Then down a semitone, G major. G augmented, G major, root position. Down a semitone, so I'm on F sharp, and I'm gonna play a D major triad in its second inversion, which is just an A chord, A shape. Up a semitone onto the note B flat, B flat major triad. B flat D F. Slide down a semitone onto the ninth fret. Down a semitone onto the ninth fret. A C sharp minor in its second inversion. Seventh fret, seven, nine, six. That's diminished. D sharp diminished. And then finally, just to finish the lick, not really an arpeggio there, just encirclement of the F sharp. Note below, note above, T.S. to pick a D F sharp. And add my little cluster on the top there, semitone clash I talked about in my Tim Miller chord voicings video. Beautiful sound. So I'll try and talk through those arpeggios as I play a bit more swiftly. So A, F minor, D major, G augmented, G major, D major, B flat major, C sharp minor, D sharp diminished, encirclement, really tricky to do that. Thank you so much for joining me today guys, I hope you found that useful. Just to conclude the triadic approach by George Garzoni, you build a triad, up or down a semitone from the final note and play a different inversion of the triad. If you play the same inversion you've got to play the notes in a different order. That's pretty much the rules. Please do look at George Garzoni's DVD, it's absolutely fantastic. I think the takeaway from his approach is that the actual notes we play are really not important. They are completely randomly generated, as you've just heard. Random triads I'm playing all over the place. But the important thing is the intention behind your playing and that you are moving towards a resolution. It's a really essential tool for developing that inside-outside uh, part of your playing, but it's only effective if the inside parts land exactly where they need to land, not a beat too soon, not a beat too late. Please remember that the phrasing and the articulation and the rhythm are so much more important than the note choice, whatever you're playing, not just when you're doing this approach at all times. And please, if anyone does have any great resources regarding phrasing, articulation and, and playing with feel, please do let me know. I'd be absolutely fascinated to have a little look at those. Hope you're all keeping well and I look forward to hearing from you all and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.